Depression, however, some of you might know, recreates reality. It goes to show the, you know, the, the orthodox conception of, of our perception is that it's not merely our self and senses picking up what's actually out there. I mean, after all, we only take a small percentage of the light spectrum, or the sound spectrum for that matter. We see very little of what's actually out there. But mental illness as well as uh, a sinful state, also considered you know, by orthodox people, a form of mental illness. Now, sin is not really an act, but a lifestyle. It's a way of thinking. It recreates what's out there. It isn't what's actually out there. It distorts what little we can see. Um, and uh, so in this case, it wasn't bad enough in my case to, um, to blind me to that, uh, the fact that a new door had opened and a new family had, had come into my life, and it means everything to me. Uh, I would have been in far worse shape. Um, so uh, I want to thank them. And, and speaking of, of them, it is Marius Apostol is the uh, reason for, for me doing this present topic. Um, the writer, uh, uh, Peter Tutia, Romania, uh, part of the Iron Guard, who died in 1991, which is a very significant uh, era to die in. He lived almost the entire of the 20th century, the entirety of the 20th century. And um, some of you may know, I mentioned uh, on other shows, that the reason I'm doing this, well, I should say the, the proximate cause of me doing this, I had been a musician up until that point. When I got into the Hart School of Music in 89, uh, and it must have been pretty good because they only take a small percentage of their applicants. But Christmas Day, uh, December 25th, 1989, I watched uh, Nikolai Ceausescu tried for about two hours by uh, officers of the army and shot. I began to realize what was happening in front of me. I began to realize that the empire that everyone was telling me was not only solid and, and ruling uh, half the world, but was reforming itself for the better, was going to be around forever, had collapsed almost overnight. And it did so without a war, without any severe trauma that you would think would be necessary for something like this. Um, it had to have been pretty fragile at that point. The only person who had predicted it uh, was Solzhenitsyn. He was off by a few years. But um, that very jarring trial and public execution on television of Ceausescu uh, was on at the time. Uh, the whole thing was, was um, broadcast. It's still available on YouTube. And it changed my life. And at that moment, I altered my, I changed my major. I became uh, history and political science um, at Hartford. And, um, uh, and so January 1st, 1990, I began this journey. Now, that's not the only reason I did this, but it was approximate cause. So Romania, the downfall of Ceausescu, um, was so jarring to me. And it was really the only, well, other than Georgia, it was really the only uh, revolution of 89 that, was, um, that wasn't peaceful. Uh, I watched recently, before preparing for this talk, um, 21st December 1989, four days before his execution, he delivered his final speech in Bucharest. And it was to 80,000 people. Of course, they had been bussed in. They were told where to stand. They were told what banners to wear and what to sing. It was interrupted more than once. Ceausescu seems like, if you want to see something pathetic, if you want to see something pathetic, look at this last speech of his. It's on YouTube, um, either with English voiceovers or um, subtitles. He is so out of touch, he doesn't seem to be all there. He's like he's drugged or he's simply too old. Elena there, his wife, is clapping like a seal most of the time. He's so out of touch with reality, um, his sole point was that any of the violence that was developing around him is a result of foreign powers seeking to uh, destroy the independence of Romania. He increased the minimum wage from, uh, I believe it was 2,000 lei to 2,100 lei a month. Well, as my sources, including um, uh, Apostol, who was in the army at the time in Romania, uh, said, well, you know, 2,100 lei a month is meaningless. If you, know, if you want to buy a, a, an album, it, it costs 500 lei. If you want to buy a pack of cigarettes, it was 100 lei. Uh, sugar was five, five lei. Uh, even a small piece of bread was five lei. So 2,100 um, lei increase is, is ridiculous. Plus the fact there was nothing on the shelves. Uh, anyway, there was such hatred against Ceausescu at the time that um, this carefully constructed crowd uh, was constantly booing him. He's increasing these, these salaries, having no idea that it was a meaningless increase. And he's being booed. 
and he has no idea what's happening around him. And Elena keeps saying that. He, she, she yells into the microphone, please calm down. What, what is going on here? No clue that there might be uh, anger against them. Some of you know the rapid industrialization of Romania after uh, 1950. Uh, Ceausescu didn't become head of the party until the 60s. But it came at a high price. They were getting foreign credits, uh, both from the Soviet Union and from abroad. Again, showing the West was very much involved in, in building up communist Romania. But also meant tremendous debt. To pay off that debt, they were pretty much selling anything that wasn't, wasn't uh, nailed down, and some things that were nailed down. Nothing was on the shelves. Medical equipment was almost non-existent. People were, especially if they were in the army at the time, for example, they could, they could take medical supplies and make a fortune selling them on the black market in Romania. No one was using the currency because it was meaningless, so a barter economy had developed there. So you really can't judge the strength of the Romanian economy after 1989. I'm sorry, from in the 1980s, because this is when the 1980-81 um, uh, is when the austerity regime uh, first began to pay off this debt and to make Romania as independent of both the Eastern Bloc and the West as possible. Uh, Ceausescu was allying with North Korea at the time. Albania was doing the same with China. He was even imitating North Korean rallies and, and speeches and things like that. But to watch him make this speech completely disconnected from reality. Every line, almost, was about how we need to protect the independence and sovereignty of Romania. So suddenly he had become a nationalist, or a national Bols Bolshevik of one kind or another. He was still an atheist, but Romania had been completely sold to foreign bankers from the East or from the West. So the hatred about him, uh, 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 the hatred for him at the time was extraordinary, and he lived only four more days. The worst part about it was in um, starting in 1991. Um, well, I should say uh, 19, 1990. The new government had had taken over. Um, um, the uh, they introduced a new IMF-based austerity program, as if they didn't have enough, as if they didn't have enough. Austerity to begin with, um, at least the, the, the issue here was that, you know, that it wasn't as bad, privatization wasn't as bad as elsewhere in the Eastern Bloc. They did not go through what Ukraine went through. But because they had nothing in the first place, austerity um, wasn't so terrible. They, they, they wanted to take 10% a year privatization rather than sudden overnight like they did in, in, in Ukraine. Um, it didn't really change the fact that, that there was nothing on the shelves, um, but at least they, you know, we did not live in a, in a, in a big, large prison camp. Uh, the Securitate was his uh, personal um, police force. This was not a party force. This was his. Uh, I mean, technically it was connected to the party, but in reality it was his and uh, loyal to him personally. Um, uh, the Kims in North Korea have something similar. It was the largest police force, um, relatively speaking, in, in Eastern, Eastern Europe, in the Eastern Bloc. Uh, at its height, it had um, about 30,000 agents, but full-time agents, I should say. There were plenty of others that, that were not full-time, and about a half a million informers. And there were a lot of people who fell through the cracks there that really had no position but were very much involved in uh, controlling the population. The new um, Stolian uh, government um, simply uh, almost continued Tachescu's policies, although in this case it was for the sake of building a free market that never quite developed. Um, but at the very least, it was better off than, than in Ukraine. Uh, in Albania, well, anyone else is better than Albania. You know, any other economic system is better. Um, you know, I could produce a, a match, and I'm better off than the economy of Albania. Um, so somebody, if not Ceausescu, knew that there was hatred against him, and he fell so quickly because his um, you know, there, there were there was defection after defection after defection. High-ranking party members and military people were abandoning this ship. Uh, he would not reverse this this austerity uh, policy. And because he had such an ignorant, you know, um, devious but ignorant um, approach to things, he just was filling these positions with his uh, relatives, most of whom were bumpkins. We didn't know anything. And the only thing that they did was um, uh, simply use this to, to enrich themselves. They lived like kings, and they flaunted it like idiots. And this is, this is where the, you know, the most illegitimate government in, illegitimate government in the history of, of politics is in Romania in the late 1980s. And no one cried for him um, when, uh, or for them, when Elena and uh, Ceausescu was shot Christmas Day, 1989. Now my topic has everything to do with this. Uh, Peter Tia 
was a member of the Iron Guard, uh, had been a member of the Communist Party at, at one point, uh, like Tukhomirov in, in, in Tsarist Russia. These are very dangerous opponents because they knew all the secrets that the um, that their, their enemies had. You know, I had been a Roman Catholic apologist before converting to Orthodoxy. I'm a dangerous opponent because I know how they think. Um, but Tutea was one of the more sophisticated philosophers of that movement. And something I've done on this show for a long time is bring out more obscure nationalists, uh, monarchists, traditionalists, uh, orthodox writers um, of different varieties that don't get the attention in the West that they deserve. As far as I know, Tutia has never been translated. Uh, Mario's Apostle has been important in having these things translated for me. Um, who will translate is, is okay for Latin languages. Uh, for things like Russian or Chinese, it's, it's worse than useless. You'll sound like an idiot if you ever try to use them. But for Latin languages, it's okay, but I needed to make sure that uh, these things were correct. And he was a big help for me, so I want to I thank him there. He gives humanity a choice. After leaving the Communist Party, um, his first big point was humanity either focuses on the ethnic group or you have a Tower, tower of Babel. Those were the two poles, but there was nothing in between. Now, later on, he changed that view. He did accept kind of a nesting... Um, uh, symphonic uh, building from uh, the, na or the family to the nation to the region. We might call that the civilization. And they exist in, in balance. The nation doesn't exist, of course, on its own. Um, the nation is a part of a much larger identity. It doesn't negate the, the national um, the specificity at all. But it has to be understood. I mean, the Romania is a Latin language. Uh, Orthodoxy um, has roots uh, far older than that language. And nations are a very specific manifestation of these universal truths. Truths are uh, objective and universal. They never change. Tutea was a Platonist. His most central concept in his entire philosophical life was that without Plato, you have nothing. It's one of the reasons that he holds um, the classic folk and medieval periods, or medieval mentalities, I should say, as the same. As uh, not not almost the same intellectually, but as reinforcing one another, they say the same same things in different ways. The nation takes its legitimacy, or the ethnic group, I should say, takes its leg legitimacy from the fact that it is a manifestation of something universal. It's easy when you're a nationalist to get involved in cultural relativism that there are no truths of society because the experiences of different nations and peoples are not the same. Um, however, it's pretty clear that, that the foundational truths of all social life are the same, but they're way too general to be uh, a matter of public policy. The family, um, husband and wife, are universal. Um, the community, especially the rural community, is universal. The monarchy is universal. Uh, society divided into very specific um, um, uh, focal points, and a division of labor, uh, law enforcement. Uh, religion, art, um, you know, what we call industry, um, the, the love of God and the desire to please him. All of these are universal. They're to be found in every society that ever existed. Well, except for the one we live in. But that just um, points to the, the, uh, the evil that we're forced to, to swim in right now. That's all true, but that's also very general. Um, it's not sufficient to have public policy based on that. Natural law is very real, is very obvious. So its rejection by the present uh, academic establishment is, is a matter of studied ignorance that natural law can't be real. And therefore, gender fluidity uh, is a consequence. Uh, it's easy to talk about that behind uh, gated uh, communities, but um, natural law is obviously true, but exceptionally general. The nation, the region, these are specific manifestations of these general truths. The Orthodox Church is divided ethnically as a matter of convenience, as a matter of recognizing natural law in this case. You can't have a conversation with someone unless you speak the same language. You can't have any kind of civic life. You can't have any communication whatsoever with someone unless you speak the same language. Now, when I say language, I'm talking about something very broad, and, and Katia is talking about something broader than just words and grammar. 
We're talking about the entire universe of shared meanings that people have. Our body language, the way we, we, we move when we speak, um, the way certain phrases are used, uh, idioms, everything. Uh, most communication is nonverbal. And this is what we mean by language. It's every custom, um, the, the moral foundation that a society has to have. As I said before, you can't have a debate or any civic life unless you agree on most things. Because in a debate... What you're saying is that your policy will bring about the results that you all want. Now, if you don't have those fundamentals in common, then debating is impossible. All you have left is violence. That's most of the Western world today. Uh, there are no foundations, and that's done on, on purpose. Now, that's changing because the multicultural uh, uh, Judaic crap is, is now considered uh, objective uh, beyond debate. So no one's actually relativist. But that's certainly no foundation. It's against foundations. It's the anti-foundation. The truth of the matter is that I don't care what society you have, what kind of government you have, or what religion you believe in. The fact of the matter is you have to share basic truths in common for there to be even rudimentary civic life. The Western world pretends that it's based its um, life on rationality, something a little bit bigger than logic, not quite to the level of news. Now, the problem with reason is that it is instrumental. I'm speaking more modern in that sense. sense uh, the classics in, 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 uh, in the medieval, um, medieval thought of reason is greater than that. But in the modern world, reason is, in the way it's used uh, since the Enlightenment, is that it is a tool. It is a method. The problem with basing your society on it is that it's not a basis. It may explain the basis. It may make sense out of the basis. It actually implies the basis. But it can't be the basis itself because reason does not generate its own foundations. Reason doesn't generate the things uh, that it reasons about. It doesn't tell you what's right or wrong, or what's good and bad, uh, at any level whatsoever. That's not its purpose. Tutia uses the word faith, which has been so destroyed in the Western world, I can't even, I, I wouldn't see using it. Faith isn't just some uh, wispy, uh, uh, saccharine, you know, uh, hands clutched over your heart kind of kind of uh, uh, believing in, in something that, that doesn't exist uh, without any information. Faith is a multifaceted word that's you know, also translated from the Russian too but, uh, when you read the Slava files and it just shows you how bad, you know, how, how these words have been totally denuded of any meaning. Faith is that which is not amenable to logical analysis. It's that which logical analysis assumes. So you think of uh, Spinoza's um, substance. That substance can be understood in a limited way using logic. It could be explained in a very limited way using logic. But logic wouldn't make any sense if you didn't have substance to begin with. Um, when we think of the, the whole of our experience rather than a specific part of it, that whole is something that's intuitive. We can't really talk about it. We call it the whole, but it, it doesn't mean very much. Fullness of everything that we, humanity and history, are. Uh, can't really be described. That's something that's intuited, and therefore we say it's something that's held by faith. Um, we know it obviously exists. At any time we speak, it's about a tiny little piece of... Um, and Ilosky and, and Florensky, they all, they all use this concept um, um, that when we, whenever we speak of anything, first of all, we're talking only about a very specific aspect of that thing. And second of all, um, we are taking it out of this huge context of the entire cosmic reality, both in a static way and in a historical way. So when we speak at all, our language is only about a very tiny aspect of something itself abstracted from uh, the, the whole of our cosmic experience that we have, uh, we assume, uh, every day. We cannot talk about it really much. We can only intuit it. But that's what he means, and that's what the Slavophiles also mean by the word faith. Um, the other way to, to explain faith uh, that used to be used is to say that we can extrapolate from things that we know about things that we don't know. You know, we can extrapolate from the fact that there we, we can study an object that there must be a hole in which that object is situated. Nothing could ever exist by itself. So when we read uh, Descartes, we come across a very strange, one of the strangest concepts in all philosophy, stolen from St. Augustine. Uh, the Kugiko uh, uh, Ergosum notion uh, implies, of course, that the ego didn't create itself. This thing that's recognizing its existence um, 
has to believe that there is something greater than it that created it, that it is dependent on a web of institutions, uh, or else there could be no, no ego uh, to think that. The number of assumptions that go into the, um, that particular view, the famous Kokuto uh, idea of Descartes or, or Legion, is one of the reasons that it's pretty much useless. But one of the essential ones is that we know that if we were able to utter that phrase, that we are not self-created. There would be no question about it if we were completely perfect and all-powerful. This wouldn't even be an issue. Therefore, we're not self-created. We're not self-sufficient. That's assumed in that very, in that very state. He means that the, these kinds of truths, the, the, the intuiting the whole in the realistic sense, real, realism with a capital R in the platonic sense, um, is what drives his belief that the classical world, the medieval world, and the folk world are pretty much the same thing seen from different points of view. He sees the medieval world, and he's referring to both East and West, as the very pinnacle of human reason. When we reject that idea, we're almost assuming that technological progress, which is a big distinction between the medieval world and the, the modern one, is how we describe progress at all. And generally speaking, that's what we mean when we use the term. We all fall into that trap, uh, no matter what. But the Middle Ages, whether it be uh, Byzantine or, or Latin, was obsessed with law, with logic, with rationality, far more so than, than the modern age. It just wasn't put to those technological ends that they are now. It always intrigued me why the Roman Empire and its long history never felt the need for smartphones or why the highly advanced Chinese uh, empires over the centuries never needed uh, the automobile. Now, something, something's different about the Western Enlightenment that is radically different from, from the rest of the world. These societies were not primitive. These societies were not ignorant. Quite the contrary. One of the things that changed is the notion of the greatest of all evils uh, in philosophy, and that is nominalism. The idea that objects exist as such, and that they are arbitrarily taken out of the whole, what we normally intuit. The modern can't understand intuition. The modern can't understand the whole. The positivist can't understand the whole. It can't even say it knows it's there, even though it's implied in every sentence that they say. Krishtia, the empirical world, can never bring truth. It's merely appearance. We saw this in, in Scovarora when we, um, but a long time ago, I think I did a two-part uh, lecture studio. He's one of my favorite philosophers of all time. Um, he, was, uh, he was an orthodox man, and although not often taken that way, um, who viewed um, uh, the empirical world in the same way. Appearance is the opposite of knowledge. Imper appearance is the opposite of essence. Appearance is the opposite of substance. It's that which is not real. Any human being that takes appearance as real is in a lot of trouble. It is um, almost the very nature of sin in the Orthodox world. Demons rule by images. I, you know, people act as if demons have this tremendous power over humanity. I, I, I want to counsel that people avoid that. Demons have the power only that we give them. St. Anthony the Great, in St. Athanasius' uh, biography of him, mocks the demons. He says, all you can do is put on a show for me. But if I'm humble and understand that what you do is nothing but appearance and therefore not true, you have no power. Uh, you know, people are, are frightened. They're frightened of Halloween. They're frightened of symbols. You know, they, they act like demons uh, uh, rule completely and utterly. They don't, unless you want them to. But demons rule only in one way. The only weapon they have against us is images. The images, it's the same thing as fantasies. We, we, we lust after a woman, and therefore we, we picture what it must be like to be with her, how wonderful it would be. Uh, we love money, we picture what it would be like to not have bills and not have to worry about that, get out of debt and everything else. It never happens that way. I was just reading uh, Anna Karenina for the nine trillionth time. Um, I am Levin, by the way, in case anyone wanted to know. Uh, the parallels between Levin and, Levin and I are just, you know, extraordinary. But whenever these people get what they claim to want, Levin especially, he gets the woman he wants, it's never, it's never good. He's idolized her. He's made such, a, such a, uh, um, uh, an idol out of her, a totem. It seems unreal. That's because it is. When he does get her, it's nothing what he thought. All of us have these fantasies, these images we have in our mind 
about what we want, to, to not have to worry about money, to have the dream job, all these things. But when these things occur to us, we realize that it's not as good as we thought. And in fact, that there's so many problems that in fantasy don't exist. This is how demons rule. Demons show you a picture, moving or otherwise, that gives you a very strong um, emotional feeling that this is something that will make you happy. This is all they have. But the postmodern world, and Tortilla you know, died in 1991, so he knows exactly what this means, and this is part of his approach to things. The entire modern world is based on these energy. If you believe that, only, that, that universals don't exist, and nominalism essentially is a belief in images, Nominalism is the sense that um, the only thing that's real is these pictures that are the same thing as words. That there are, there are no real uh, meanings in things. Only the, um, the meaning and the truth that we give them. This is essential to the modern world. It's essential to industrialization. It's essential to uh, liberalism, socialism. It's essential to the entire modern world. This idea that there are no intrinsic meanings to the world. The mystification is that we, this vague collective we, give those meanings. In fact, the reality is, nominalism means that whoever has the most power decides what's real and what is not. Both capitalism and socialism, as both political and economic types, agree on that score. All that exists is the party, is the, the product, is um, progress, uh, defined only in technical terms. He uses the term autonomous to refer to man without God. Now, I've used the word autonomous in a very different way, the way that Kant uses it. But he means autonomous meaning free from any influence from the divine, or what he would like to believe that is possible. But such a man can't create a moral order. Such a man, in fact, has absolutely no recourse from his fantasies, from these images. Every step of every day is based on one fantasy or another. There is no intrinsic moral order if that's the case. And when he, he talk about, talks about the divine, he's also referring to Plato's forms. If Plato's forms exist, then God exists. Or else you'd have to explain where the forms came from. And in my case, uh, I read The Republic for the first time in, in, uh, when I was 17. Um, actually, with the Gorgias, I read first, and then The Republic. I became a Platonist, and in a very short time, I was a Christian afterward. The Plato, uh, as St. Justin Martyr would say, is the ultimate gateway to um, understanding uh, Christ. Man can't create anything. Man is a subject. Man can't create, he only can recreate. Without the absolute, uh, in the platonic sense, everything is relative motion. The realization we have to come to is an existential one in Tutia's world. Truth and being in the, the real sense of the term exists only in God. We are relative. We are completely contingent. That realization changes everything. Of course, the modern world rejects that idea. Everything in, in there is contingent. Machiavelli, Tutia will say, is the clear and almost obvious conclusion to this kind of thinking. Machiavelli is the moral expression of materialism. Now, materialism is a problem for a whole bunch of reasons, um, you know, apart from the obvious. Number one, it's a universal. And no materialist is, is anything but anomalous. So how you, you, could, you could see materialism in this great universal uh, idealistic sense, as strange as that might sound, doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, number two, matter never exists in and of itself. You know, uh, Barclay had this, this, uh, this fun habit of, of, of whenever he was asked whether or not to prove the existence of God, he would ask him, well, please prove the existence of matter first. And almost his whole philosophy was based on the fact that any proof of the existence of matter assumes it. Because all we know are our psychological states, the images, the pictures that our, our eyes might take of something. That doesn't mean it's real. It just means that we sense it. Um, proving matter exists is a hell of a lot more difficult than anything else. Um, you can't prove that God exists because he's not one object among others. That would be an insult. Uh, the pagan uh, archetypes are one object among others. And they understand themselves that way. God, in a philosophical and metaphysical sense, would be the um, substance of Spinoza, in a sense. I've always been a big fan of his. Um, and whenever you argue, especially in the modern world, against nominalism, you, have, you either um, expressly or implicitly appeal to Spinoza. God can't be proven because he's the reason that any proof can exist. 
Yahweh means I am who am. That's exactly what Christ called himself in the New Testament over and over again. Before Abraham was, I am. And that was the first time the Jews tried to kill him because he was claiming to be God. Um, he called himself Yahweh in that statement, and he did it more than once. That is the foundation of all things. It is a reason that there could be any logic or thought whatsoever. It's that which unites everything. This is a whole but that we uh, try to intuit. You have to believe it by faith. This is what faith means. It has nothing to do with being blind, or having no, no evidence of something. No, it's that which must, must exist in order for there to be any evidence, for logic to make any sense. Logic appeals to many things, including the fact that, that the world is essentially rational and regular. Logic doesn't work unless the world is law-based. But law isn't inherent to matter, so it has to have another source. Tutia lived the majority of his life under um, Romanian communists. And he, he held a few axioms about communism. He had to be very careful. Um, where the assumption of all communists, no, I happen to disagree with this notion, but the communism was about equality. There were plenty of communists in the Soviet Union that rejected that idea. Tutia held that if anything is about equality, it has to be false. Because equality in any sense, except in, in well, in, in almost any sense, in the moral equality we have before God, or insignificance before God, is probably the only way that equality could ever be used in a sentence rationally. But um, the notion is that uh, communism is strictly about making everyone equal, and therefore, since it's not true, it doesn't exist anywhere, not even in our minds, it has to be rejected. Now, people like Gorbachev and many others made the argument that no, uh, Marxism had a lot more to do with creating a man that's in full control of his life, that's fully autonomous in the Kantian sense of the word. Tutea uses the phrase that communism is equality, or I'm uh, sorry, happiness by force, that humanity can be forced to be free. Now, Rousseau didn't quite mean that. You know, Rousseau used that phrase um, in actually a very positive way. He meant it as that people are irrational. And when you tell them the truth about something and explain where that truth comes from, you're forcing them to be free. Because truth and freedom are, are very, very close. Um, you can't be free in any meaningful sense unless you're living the truth and you believe it. Forcing someone to be free is taking an irrational person, holding them down, and saying, here's where you're wrong. And you know, making sure that they know the entire foundation of, of what it is that they're, they're wrong about. That's not what he means here. It is friendship and happiness by force, meaning that the state, in its full control over um, economic life, can produce a situation of total equality without sacrificing production or efficiency. And that, it's assumed, will make people happy and create brotherhood and eliminate the need for warfare. So from that foundation, communism for him was nonsense. Now, communism for me, I mean, there are plenty of communists who believe that the communist state is meant to make everyone equal. Um, in my case, communism was never meant really for anything, except that, um, I'm, I'm not just referring to Lenin or Stalin, I'm referring to Marx as well, that this was a way for a, a ruling class to take over a country and transfer all the wealth of its labor to itself. Um, Fidel Castro uh, just died, and, um, you know, it doesn't really matter because Raul is still in control. Uh, as Matt Parrott would say, uh, Raul might be a, a um, the Gorbachev of, of um, uh, Cuban communism. But the man, despite fighting you know, imperialism in, in many ways, um, was a tyrant, was an absolutist in the worst sense of the word, and took Cuba, which under Batista was a very good man. Batista ruled over a first world country. But within a couple of decades, it had become a third world country. Um, there was no equality there because, like most communist leaders, um, Fidel Castro was extremely wealthy. I've said this before, but when, when Trotsky died, he was a billionaire, even in um, that era's um, value. You see, when you control a government, when, when you control not just a government, but the entire economy of a society, when you control what everything, uh, how everything is produced, and therefore the product of that production, you are fabulously wealthy beyond all belief. 
every Marxist leader died a very, very wealthy man. Every Marxist leader had more money than you can imagine. Other than the Rothschilds and Rockefellers, um, Trotsky died one of the richest men in the world. Um, you see the, the luxury uh, uh, watches that I see in pictures of, of Fidel from many, many decades ago. He had many mansions in different parts of the world. They just, you know, um, it was never about making everyone equal. It was an excuse. But I don't want to take away from things that Fidel may have done that were positive. Uh, I don't want to eliminate that. But as far as Cubans are concerned, he took a first world country and turned it into a third world country. Cuba could be likened in 1955, say, to uh, Lebanon. Uh, there was a lot of corruption and graft, and there was high debt, but it was a first world country. Uh, Batista had built uh, the country's, uh, the island's infrastructure, its electrification, had radically increased um, uh, literacy, and lowered spending in the army and security services. So the money could be freed up for the things that were really necessary. So he couldn't have been that bad of a guy if he's pulling money from security and putting it into where he really wanted it, uh, in education, in all senses of the word. Uh, that was all destroyed under Castro. About 35% of, of Cuba's GDP was from Soviet subsidies. And the subsidy, among other ways, was to be found in the ridiculous assertion that one ton of sugar was identical in value to one ton of oil, if oil could be measured in that way. That was the nature of the subsidy. One of the reasons that the U.S., I know this is slightly off topic, although not entirely, one of the reasons that the U.S. Um, pulled away from Castro was that state of Hawaii, uh, which in, only became a state in 56, um, was the dominant sugar producer of the U.S. They must have lost their minds when the U.S. was willing to, to open up a, a greater trade uh, with, with Cuba. They refused to um, uh, open trade, especially in that, in that agricultural area, and therefore uh, Castro went to the Soviet Union, who became very dependent on Cuba for sugar, because not a lot of places to get, get it in, in, uh, in that old empire, the exception of sugar beets in Ukraine. Anyway, that was slightly off topic. Uh, the point I was trying to make, though, was that all of these rulers were extremely wealthy in the name of the people. Equality was not the agenda, not even in theory. If Gorbachev was right, it's more about creating a man that was equally comfortable in many fields. The well-rounded Renaissance man was, was even Marxist. Uh, conception of what the final agenda was. In the few words he ever uttered about what communism was supposed to be, they revolved around having a man that was not part of any division of labor. He was completely free because he was never forced into uh, one very specific job for his whole life. He could be a, a rancher, he could be a computer specialist, he could be a chemist, uh, he could be a movie director, he could do all of these things in the same day and have it not be a problem for anybody. This is what happens in his mind when labor as a whole controls all of production. Labor, and when labor as a whole, I mean labor as actual people. Uh, now, of course, the way that labor really was, it was a slogan, a te technical term with a capital L. Same thing for pro proletarian or even kulak. These terms were technical terms that didn't mean what we normally you say labor. We mean workers, people in the factories and the fields. That's not what they meant. Worker. Uh, in communist uh, terminology, really was someone who supported the party, no matter how much money they made. Equality was never the issue um, in both uh, uh, Romania's case and in Cuba's case. By the time um, these leaders died or killed, the country was ruled as an oligarchy. The very fact that Castro's brother, Raul, is running the country now suggests something other than democracy, in, in any sense of the word. So uh, equality was never the agenda. But um, Tortilla is just showing one abstraction. He's making the argument that all revolutionary movements depend on abstractions, things that don't exist. Um, rights, such as freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, these are abstractions. They don't exist. Um, uh, speech is permissible if it's true. I never make the argument that, that I should be heard uh, because um, uh, I have a right to be heard. I wince when I have to make a statement like that, or I have a right to believe what I please. Well, that might be true, but I never speak like that because I'm right. You know, we need to be heard because we tell the truth. We suffer for it. Um, you, you know, there's a right to do something only if there is a corresponding restraint. 
if we have a right to free speech, that means only true statements could be made, and the ignorant or the mentally ill or those who are not autonomous, who are driven by other factors other than reason and thought, have to be shut up. In fact, um, uh, Edmund Burke says the same thing. Edmund Burke states that uh, there is an equal right to be silent as there is to speak. I said this before, those who are, who are ignorant on the topic should not talk about it. Those who are only a little bit educated on the topic are even more dangerous than the totally ignorant. That's been happening too in the Cuba uh, debates that have erupted um, among nationalists recently, um, in that most of us aren't experts in, on Cuba. I'm one of them. And any time I've debated the topic over the last few days, I've made that very clear. I claim no expertise whatsoever uh, on, on the Cuban uh, economy. I also claim no expertise on the Romanian society either. Um, so Tutia doesn't deal in abstractions whatsoever. This is classic conservatism in the true, uh, much older sense of the term. You never hear Aristotle or Plato refer to rights at all. Although well, some translations actually make the use of phrase civil rights. I believe Alan Bloom's translation of the Republic has that in it. But there was no conception there. It may have existed, but only in context. Plato's entire argument, his entire reason for existing was that the sophists could act like they were knowledgeable about anything. They were actors. They knew how to sound uh, authoritative, whether they knew anything or not. They could make any argument sound good, which actually brings us to the next point, which is that if Tutea got older, one of his central concepts was um, an increasing skepticism about human reason. And this is something that's, that's bothered me recently, that once your knowledge grows to a tremendous degree, your area of expertise grows where you just know so much about it, you realize that you could make a, an extremely convincing argument about pretty much anything in the field. Um, you know enough good and enough bad in your subject matter that you can make anything sound good. And the fact is, in American society, there is no crazy theory that you couldn't hold that doesn't have some very smart people who believe in it, especially in academia. Citing sources even doesn't really do it because there's plenty of smart people who hold to nonsensical ideas. Now, anybody who holds that anything other than the family or, or the individual, I should say, Anyone who holds that the individual is the foundation of society is an idiot. It's self-refuting. The fact that you didn't create that um, statement, you in fact are imitating people who created that statement, is proof against it. It's self-contradictory. But the family is not a natural uh, creation. These people are saying it not because they really mean it, but because there's another agenda there. People who hold to these things are fools. However, there are plenty of people who make what sound like very convincing arguments against it. If you have a large data set, you could just take those things that support your position and list all of them. And if you don't know, you read this thing and say, well, this is overwhelming. Your position is true. But when you know the whole data set, you realize all they've done is taken a handful of things from this huge sea of data and just focus on that. Now, we're all guilty of that to some extent. But Tutea, near the end of his life, began to wonder how useful really is reason. You think of social science, you think of the trillions of dollars that have been given to academics in this field, psychology, political science, sociology. What problems have they solved, intellectually speaking? I can't think of one single one. Because the minute you mention a, something where there's a consensus, I'll say, well, there are 20 papers I just saw, peer-reviewed papers that, that say the opposite. Part of the reason for this is language. While language is the foundation of any society in the sense, an intellectual foundation of any society, because you can't be a society without language, and therefore ethnic nationalism happens to be true, uh, because language really is the ethnos, that's what typifies the ethnos, um, it's fluid. See, the problem with the social sciences is that um, language is always changing, meanings are always changing. And yet if you want to define variables, if you want to define variables, you have to use language. You have to use words. There could be no system of logic without language. Tertia argues that any abstraction, you know, if you use the phrase, I am a man, you said absolutely nothing. Because there is no abstract I, there is no abstract uh, M, you certainly can't have a definite article, and there is no abstract man. Now, you can speak of yourself as embedded somehow, that I am a very good carpenter that I am a Romanian, 
these things um, make sense. You know, it's very surprising how many um, uh, neocons and, and liberals of various stripes will condemn the concept of nationalism, that it doesn't exist, the nation is just a figment of their imagination, the nation is, is, is fraud, it's just a political excuse for power, uh, it's very new, you know, on and on. But they'll speak of the international community as if it's an object, or international law as if we all agree. These things are not inventions. The nation is. You need to be very clear on this. Abstraction is a great evil because it actually doesn't refer to anything. That's not the same thing as a universal. Universal refers to everything that's class. An abstraction doesn't refer to anything. Um, a universal is very different. Uh, when, I, when I first read Aristotle, I struggled with the difference between a universal and an abstraction. An abstraction is almost, um, an abstraction really can be seen as, a, as a, an abbreviation for the sake of ease of communication. A universal is loaded with content. Universal is the very meaning and core of everything that's class. So the moral good, for example. You could use that as, a, as an abstraction for the sake of just, you know, for the sake of conversation. But when you use it as a universal, you're referring to the very concept. You're referring to all, all things that make an action good. Uh, right-making uh, uh, acts. Uh, right, right make information that you can have to judge whether or not an action is right or not. There's a very big difference there. The only time you can refer to something is in context. And this has everything to do with his uh, concept, uh, very common in Orthodox countries, of intuition, of faith. When you reason about anything, you're taking one object out of the whole, and you're not even reasoning about one, ob one object. You're referring to an aspect of that object. Um, Nikolai Lossky made the argument that any object that you might analyze, whether it be conceptual or not, is itself a universe, because really it's a collection of many other objects. If you refer to a human being, you're referring to their mind, their heart, their soul, their ethnic group, the way they look. It's actually many attributes collected into one thing, and therefore it's a universal. That's not the same thing as referring to the rights of man. The very fact that you're referring to man as an abstraction proves that, because I've never seen an abstract man, I can't picture an abstract man, I can't talk about an abstract man. It doesn't make sense. We can talk about groups of people, though. That makes sense. This is why nations are so important. You know, it's broad enough uh, to be a self-sufficient entity, but not too broad as to be, you know, completely useless, and not too narrow as to be non-self-sufficient. So the family can never be used. A family can't be self-sufficient. The nation can be. The concept of international law or um, the international community is my favorite one. That doesn't exist. I don't even know what they mean, even conceptually, when they re refer to that. I guess they mean the elites of the world at any given moment, taken together, are the international community. I think it's what they mean. They don't know that they mean that. But these are the same people who will condemn nationalism as mythical. But what is the conclusion there? If language makes all statements slippery and vague, then really all you have left is authority. And that, finally, is a conclusion here. This is what he means by faith. This is the centrality of his philosophy. I could make completely convincing arguments, even logically convincing arguments, about opposite things and anything that I know about. Uh, Kant speaks of this in his, um, his uh, antimonies and the critique of pure reason. If language and even reason makes opposite things equally true, depending on how you state them and how you present the evidence, then authority, and I mean power, authority, and faith become absolutely dominant. Reason doesn't provide its own ends. It doesn't provide moral judgment. So you can't base anything on reason. It's extremely difficult to tell whether or not um, any use of reason is actual, you know, is honest, honestly a use of reason, or if it's a rationalization. You know, E. Michael Jones has written many books, uh, Degenerate Moderns being the main one, where he can trace the development of an ideology in Freud or, or Margaret Mead, um, as a justification of their lifestyle. In fact, it's overwhelming how um, lifestyle is connected to what these people think. They're rationalizing something rather than developing this, this ideology for the common good. Any power center, especially a state, wants to be unlimited, it wants to be beyond good and evil, and it wants you to believe that it exists and is functioning for the common good. This is a myth of any institution, especially our contemporary institutions. 
and they'll attack their um, they'll, they'll attack their enemies by projecting this problem onto them. Globalists refer to the globe as this you know global humanity as a real object, but condemn nationalism, which is far more reasonable and smaller and manageable, as a myth. This is the state. This is the international regime. This is uh, any power center has a tendency to project its its problems onto its enemy. Faith matters because language is too slippery. Logic doesn't exist unless language exists. Therefore, logic is always going to be struggling. Social sciences um, believing that using quantitative methods, therefore, they're coming to the truth, which is an iffy proposition to begin with, are always going to be relative. But this is the nature of empiricism, and this is the nature of appearance. The question of truth is to go beyond appearance. This is why he loves Plato so much. The classicals and the medievals. And by classic, I mean he really means Plato, Aristotle, and Plotinus. Um, and the medievals, whether east or west. Their obsession was to use logic to strip away um, unnecessary detail, anything extraneous, and get to the essence of the matter. But if you're a modern, and hence anomalist, there is no essence of the matter. So you're only using logic, therefore, as rationalization. To base your world on reason, or to pretend that you're basing your world on reason, but not believing in stable essences doesn't make any sense. It's a contradiction. Because if you're basing reason on appearance, you're basing your thought on something that's constantly changing, being reinterpreted, and something that ultimately doesn't exist. It's too fleeting. If you claim to believe in something objectively, or you have an objective, certain knowledge of something, then you must be a Platonist. It's only having that um, universal, unchanging uh, world of you know, the forms, um, the way uh, St. Augustine refers to numbers. This is not only proof of God's existence, that there is this unchanging uh, entity that is all-powerful, but therefore it's also proof of Plato. You cannot be anomalous and be rational. You cannot be anomalous and be anything but self-seeking. Therefore, you cannot be modern and be rational. The modern world is based on fraud for this reason, and this is what uh, Peter Kutia had dedicated his life to. A way to take Plato and uh, re-enthrone him as the center of all philosophy. He is someone who deserves to be read more. Um, I know I focus mostly on very general uh, metaphysical things here, but, but I did that on purpose. That's the center of everything. If you admit to objective knowledge, you must admit the form. If you admit the forms, well, they had to come from somewhere. They couldn't come from any kind of natural development. Therefore, they come from God. It's really not that hard. Truth is out there. Objective, certain truth is out there. If you just drop self-interest, stop trying to rationalize things, stop obsessing about your lifestyle or those around you, and be honest. Anyway, um, I thank everyone for listening. My friends as well as my enemies. My enemies are stupid. But they do uh, keep me on my toes. I've enjoyed the debates over Castro. They forced me to go back to some of the original uh, material. But we can debate with each other and not hate each other. You can debate with someone. Believe it or not, you can debate with someone and not attack their mother or how they look. I know it might come to a shock to some of you, but it can be done. Debate is proper only if we respect one another. I didn't say like one another. Completely different thing. Respect one another. Thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next time.